a Cheruscan to submit to strict drill and unquestioning obedience. Germanic warriors reject firm leadership. But Arminius proves an excellent pupil. A young man, quick to pick things up and unusually talented for a German, is a contemporary verdict. This Cheruscan is turning into the perfect Roman soldier. This education of a Germanic tribesman in the Roman Empire always had two sides. A technical side, how do I lead an army, what weapons do I carry, and an ideological side. Politics and Rome as one and the same thing. Rome as the ideal we should worship. And the Romans combined them. Around 1 BC, Arminius receives his first posting to Pannonia in the Balkans. He's a captain of the Auxilia, a mounted force of Germanic mercenaries. Tribes in this Balkan province have risen against Rome. Rome hits back hard, sending 15 legions, more than 100,000 men, half the entire army, to crush the rebels. It's a show of the absolute superiority of Roman military tactics. Roman power lies not in the courage of individual soldiers, but in the strategic cooperation of military units. Arminius will never forget this lesson. In open warfare, Rome is invincible. Two different ways of waging war meet head-on here. The Roman army is professional and disciplined. Different ranks have precisely defined skills and roles. Each man knows he can do this or that. He commands so many men and he has the means and equipment to do this or that. For the Germans, however, this was a relationship that had grown together between chiefs and nobles and selected warriors who would cross from tribe to tribe, who had sworn allegiance to those chiefs. In their own way, the warriors were professionals too. It was a personal relationship. And in some ways, of course, it also instilled discipline. That is, it was a question of honor. And it was a situation in which they were attached to this one man and they owed him allegiance. The Romans advanced in a closed formation called the Tortoise. The barbarians attacked in a wedge-shaped formation called the Boar's Head. The force of the impact is only momentarily effective. The armored legions can mow down their attackers. Ranks so tightly closed, they function like a single body. We don't know exactly what Arminius did in the Pannonian War, but he must have fought with distinction. Back in Rome, the Emperor Augustus makes him a knight the highest honor open to a member of a Germanic tribe. A noble son from the forests of Germania has become a respected citizen of Rome. Fifteen years since he left home. Impossible to say whether he misses his family, the freedom, the endless forests. <sighs> Impossible to say what ambitions he holds today. We know of many cases where Germanic tribesmen in the service of Rome learned how to behave in the Roman way without feeling Roman or becoming loyal to Rome. 
Rom die Treue zu halten. Es ist eben nicht so einfach. It's not easy to make people genuinely committed to a system that may bring them great privileges, but also requires a change of identity. Aber eben doch not everyone can do that. Wechsel verlangt, der eben nicht jedem leicht fällt. In the year 7 AD, Augustus appoints a new governor for Germania. He's a relative called Publius Quinctilius Varus. He's described as physically corpulent and spiritually complacent. And yet, Varus has proved himself in a crisis. He crushed a Jewish revolt as governor in Syria, crucifying 2,000 rebels. He came into this rich province a poor man, and he left this poor province a rich man, they said later. In his glory days, coins were minted with his likeness, a rare privilege. Varus had the skills and experience a Roman senator selected for that job in Germania would need. And Augustus would certainly not have sent someone there just because he was a relative. Unless he was also convinced that he had the experience to carry out what was expected of him. But then, Augustus makes a decision with unforeseen consequences. He sends Arminius to Germania at Varus's side. It's a decision that will have pleased Varus. Arminius has the reputation of being brave, disciplined and loyal. And he knows the Cheruski and their fighting style. He speaks their language. In 7 AD, Arminius comes back to his homeland. Over the past 15 years, the Romans have surged on, building up their new province, constructing camps along the rivers Rhine, Main and Lippe to consolidate their control in Germania Magna. Haltern on the Lippe is their administrative center, the capital of the new province. Close to today's Roman museum at Haltern, they create a base for three legions, a total of 20,000 men. There are barracks, smithies for making weapons, kilns for pottery, and villas for the high officials. And on the Lipper is a harbor for the supply of Roman goods and luxuries, that make life bearable in these barbarian lands. Right from the beginning, the Romans tried to give the impression that they had subdued Germania. In his last will and testament, Augustus wrote, I have conquered Germania as far as the mouth of the Elbe. Whenever a general won a little victory in Germania, he would call himself Germanicus, as if to say he had the Germanic tribes under control. The Romans minted coins showing Germania as a woman sitting on the ground in mourning with a broken spear. So ordinary Romans really would have got that impression. But Tacitus contradicted that. He said, that's nonsense. Germania has not been defeated. The Germanic tribes are living just as they did 200 years ago, completely free. On his return, Arminius may have looked in vain for the signs of Roman domination. Some distance from the Roman forts, the advanced Roman way of life is nowhere to be seen. Arminius will have taken the opportunity to be reunited with his father, Segimerus. The time to speak of the greatness of Rome or of his homeland. However warm the greeting, 
His father must have had mixed feelings at seeing his son enter the family house in the uniform of a Roman soldier. Arminius must have paid lip service to the advantages brought by Rome by being part of the empire, the wealth, skills and justice, and an end to the endless civil wars between the Germanic tribes. There will soon be roads, cities, even heated stone floors instead of beaten clay. But these are two men talking past each other. For Segimerus, his son is denying the land of his birth. The Romans are squeezing the tribes for tributes like the grapes for their sour wine, counting them like cattle to levy taxes, and forbidding free men to bear weapons. Without a sword, a Cheruscan cannot be free. But his people are powerless. Times have changed. The Cheruscans are condemned to a life of slavery. Their freedom is lost. But not all Germanic tribesmen insist, like Segimerus, on freedom and independence. On the river Lahn, near the small town of Waldgirmas, archaeologists have made a remarkable discovery. When Roman remains were found here in 1993, they thought it was just another army camp. The Romans said they'd built proper towns east of the Rhine, but the experts had always dismissed it as propaganda. But now there was evidence of something more. This is a civilian town. So far, the only Roman town discovered on this side of the Rhine. This was planned to be used by Romans and Germans. Roman historian Cassius Dio described the strategy behind it. By building forums, houses and baths, the defeated peoples were seduced into peace. And then, archaeologists put together conclusive proof of Rome's attitude to its newly conquered territory. We were really surprised when we found fragments gilded on one side with gold leaf. We soon realized that they must be parts of a bronze statue. But when we found a stirrup, a part of a harness and a horse's hoof, we said to ourselves, this is an equestrian statue. And, of course, the size of the parts made it clear how big the whole statue was. It was life-size. And since it was gilded, a statue at that time and at that place could only have been a statue of the Emperor Augustus. This golden monument stood in the Forum. The fact there was a gilded, life-size equestrian statue in Waldgirmes shows the Romans clearly making their claim to the territory, above all to the local population. You have to imagine how it would have looked to a local tribesman, standing in the forum, looking at this glistening gold statue of a horse and rider with a realistic portrait of the emperor. It must have seemed utterly amazing to him. Varus must have expected to find Germania already pacified when he arrived at Halton and met Arminius. Varus is tasked with turning Germania into a fully-fledged Roman province. Arminius' assessment of the situation is invaluable. Arminius. But a mere captain of the auxiliary cavalry would never tell his general what to do. Varus insists, 
a German knows how to deal with German.